Well, good afternoon and welcome everyone. Uh, we have a couple of objectives that we'd like to um, just discuss briefly up front as to what we hope to accomplish today. First of all, we're gonna to discuss today's modern um, engine oil categories. We'll also talk about, uh, briefly later on, we'll talk about filtration technologies. And then finally, the oil change process and how that's affecting shops and technicians changing oil uh, in today's world. So that's what we hope to accomplish between now and an hour from now. And again, we'll have a question and answer session when we're all uh, finished up with the, uh, with the topic today. When we're discussing registration count, it seems like um, throughout the United States, throughout Canada, the registration count keeps continuing to rise each and every year. And we have some statistics on the screen there with regards to the factory fill for synthetic oil just continues to rise along with those registration increases. One of the most important things there to look at and the to, to takeaway from this slide is around seven out of 10 vehicles now are coming from the factory with synthetic oils. And there are two specific photographs on that slide, just to uh, talk about some important points about the use of synthetic oils on modern engines. The first thing is both of those pictures were taken from a 2015 uh, Chevy 1500. Um, and that truck was uh, invited to go to the uh, Exxon Mobil lab to be completely disassembled by an auto mechanic, by a technician. And that truck has five, it was run for 500,000 miles and an additional 20,000 miles was run on it on a dynamometer to simulate a uh, load from a trailer being pulled for 20 uh, extra thousand miles. So the oil was changed on that truck at, at 520,000 miles and it was pulled apart. Um, but up until that point, the oil was changed on that vehicle at 20,000 mile intervals, nothing sooner. So when the truck hit 20,000 miles, we changed the oil and the filter, hit another 20,000 and so forth and so on. And as you could see there, the bearing and the camshaft as well within uh, the wear specifications for a truck you'd expect to be pulling apart with uh, about a half a million miles on it. So there is a testament to the truth that synthetic oils are doing their job to serve and protect the engines that they were designed to run with. And more importantly, and you'll hear us uh, say this a couple of times today, when we're changing oil on these cars today, and we're, we're, we're putting back the synthetic oil product that the vehicle perhaps was born with. We're doing so for one main reason, and that's to make sure that if anything was to occur during the warranty period, we could provide documentation that the vehicle's oil change up to this point was all documented and the proper oil and filter was installed in this vehicle. Again, if the issue of warranty ever needs to come up or be adjusted or looked at by the OE or the manufacturer, in this case, the dealership. So when we talk about properties of engine oil, let's discuss this a little bit from the definition of what viscosity is. When you think of viscosity, and I like to always use props when I teach this class out in the, in the, in the field, um, you know, I'll have containers of oil. Um, this happens to be mineral oil, and you could probably hear that. That it you know, pretty much has a viscosity that mimics water. Compared to a 20W50 product, and when I'm passing these around in class, I have a BB that's inside. While not so much a scientific test, it kind of demonstrates the difference, let's say, and you can see this on your screen there. We have a mineral oil that's in the uh, in one of the test tubes there, followed by a 20 grade oil, followed by a 40 grade oil. And I have three uh, marbles or steel balls, and I might do this, you know, in class live, but I'm, depending on the ambient temperature and what the temperature of the oil is, that could take onwards of up to 50 seconds to a minute. So you can imagine if we had the wrong viscosity of oil on a cold engine, you know, 20 degrees below zero, zero degrees 
degrees Fahrenheit. It's going to take a while to get up to that upper valve train and do its job to protect the engine for which it was designed. Thicker oil, although it improved, you know, provides improved protection at higher operating temperature, it offers a little bit of a reduced fuel economy. As we start to move through the program today, we're going to see specifically uh, what the category of GF6 B is going to be serving and what the importance of that is for fuel economy, why it was invented and why it's a subcategory of the new GF6 specifications. When we're discussing grades of oil, we see two different uh, containers on the screen here. We have a straight SAE grade 30 and we have a 5W30 grade oil there. Now, What's the difference between the two? I'm going to ask uh, everyone in uh, attendance today to answer a question shortly here. So here's the, here's the thing. When we're testing oil at 212 degrees, which is the operating temperature for the J300 specification, they basically take the oil in a laboratory and they run it through a meter, a viscosometer. And that basically rates the oil to come in at a specific grade based on how the oil behaves in that flow test. So an SAE is doing these tests and they get the oil up to 212 degrees. They now see how fast it flows through and fills up a tube. If it behaves like a 20 grade oil, it was assigned a 20 grade spec, a 20 grade specification. If it flowed a little uh, longer, it goes to a 30 grade spec. Even longer than that, it may go to a 40 grade spec and so on. What's important to understand we're discussing, when we're discussing grades of oil is the fact that the operating temperature for the hot viscosity is done at 212 degrees. The difference now lies in when we have a multi-grade oil, like a 5W30 or a 5W20. Now we've put oil tests at zero degrees Fahrenheit, negative 18 degrees centigrade, and we have a number and a letter. The W does not stand for weight. It never did. It stands for winter. So we have an oil now that's going to behave a little bit differently when it's cold. So we have a cold weather viscosity, the zero, right, or the five W. Zero, five precedes the W, so we have a winter grade, a cold viscosity grade of oil, followed by the suffix number, which is the 30 or the 20. Five W, winter grade viscosity or cold viscosity. The 30 after that is the hot weather or the hot viscosity. Please try and remember as technicians, and this comes up a lot, when I was developing the material for this, I went to countless numbers of shops and just asked a very simple question. So does your shop use 0W20? And it was astonishing to me at the time, how many shops, how many technicians said, I don't use 0W anything in any of my customers' cars. It's too thin. And hence, that's where the problem lies. A lot of us believe that the zero, right, is, is too thin of an oil and it's gonna become, you know, too thin when it gets to operating temperature. Perhaps what we really need to be doing is thinking about what happens to the oil when it comes back down to, let's say, ambient temperature of 30 degrees, 40 degrees, 70 degrees, or even 80 degrees outside. Remember that cold pumpability I was discussing earlier. What's going to happen right to that oil if we're using the wrong grade oil for that cold pumpability in the morning? If it's not there, the valve train's going to suffer, and it's going to suffer for a very long time. And it may even start to give us, uh, let's just call it um, check engine lights on the dashboard, because the ECM is now timing from the time we begin cranking the engine, and that oil pressure sensor now provides to give us a reading. If that is delayed over and over and over again, we might 
have DTCs set specifically for the timing that it took for that upper valve train to receive that oil. It was too late. So you'll have engines that sit there and move the variable valve timing back and forth, right, just to see if it advances and retards correctly. Oil plays a very important role. The properties of the oil plays a very important role in the operation of those hydraulic circuits. If they're late and we're looking for timing to change when they're commanded to do so, and that commanded change is delayed or retarded, we could set valve train codes against that. And all it is, perhaps, is the oil viscosity that's in the engine at the time. So we have two different containers on the screen. An SAE30 is on the left-hand side, and we have a 5W30 on the right-hand side. So here's the question I was getting at. Based on the two engine oils that you see, or that you just saw on the screen, the standard SAE 30 grade and the 5W30, what's the difference? Yes, the correct answer is B. They have a similar viscosity of a 30 grade oil at operating temperature. There is absolutely no difference between that 30, that straight grade 30, and the 5W30, right, when both oils get to 212 degrees. They both behave very similar. The difference is the 5W30 is going to flow a little easier when it's cold. So, the American Petroleum Institute for years has been providing this uh, API donut on the back of our oil containers. And what this generally means for gasoline engines, when we have an S rating there, is that that is the service category for gasoline engines or spark ignited engines. If we have a C as the prefix, those are for diesels, and that applies to the commercial application of this service category. The American Petroleum Institute basically designates these classifications and these donuts for spark ignited engines as well as compression ignited engines, diesel engines if you will, and they are vastly different. So what this basically means when the consumer, a shop or a technician goes to source an oil that's specifically for an application that we're changing the oil for, we can look at that donut and know that it at least meets an industry specification, in this case, the American Petroleum Institute. And I don't want you to confuse the industry specification with, let's just call it for right now, the certification that the manufacturers use or an OE oil specification. They may be vastly different. So from this screen forward, from this section of the class on, and you may hear us say this a couple of different times, the most important thing we could do when we're changing oil is to think first about the not just the SAE grade of oil that needs to go in. The first thing we should be dealing with is if it has an OE specification. OE specification first, the grade of oil second. Very, very important. On the engine oil service categories, across the board, I've indicated that we have the API service donut, and that's these ratings that you see across here with the letter S for spark ignited, right? S, 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 H, S, J, S, L, S, M. Through the years, I've put the boxes there with the oil service category, years of introduction through time. So you have a timeline from the left to the right. And discussing the API rating first, you could see that up until May of 2018, the most recent specification that was indicated from the American Petroleum Institute was SN+. Prior to that, we had SN. So that began around 2010 or 2011, and we stayed with SN right through approximately May of 2018. Now it's important to make sure you understand that the SN to the SN plus uh, change, the SN plus 
was a supplement category to the SN uh, category at that time. It wasn't a complete modification or change to the entire category. It was a supplement. We did that to the diesel oils back in 2017. And you'll see that there's going to be a different change, a different modification for the compression ignited side of that compared to the deep the gasoline side. So across the timeline here, and you'll notice in blue, I put down everything that's current, okay? Everything that's red is obsolete. So I didn't see a need to go earlier than 1996. So through these years, we've now come to a point right here around 2010. And in 2010, and from a domestic standpoint, we're going to choose and pick on General Motors here. I mentioned that the API rating through the years, as you can see the intervals of when those API service categories were implemented. Around 2010, if you come straight down on the slide, you'll notice Dexos Gen 1 was basically released for a General Motors factory fill globally. Dexos 1 at the time was a semi-synthetic product that was introduced, as I said, as a global spec. So if General Motors was basically building a car in China or in Singapore or in South America or in Detroit. All of the engines were introduced and they received a Gen 1 Dexos 1 specification, semi-synthetic oil. At around 2015, give or take, middle of the year, General Motors released Dexos 1 Gen 2. The difference between the two oils. The Gen 2 is a full synthetic product. Now, I want to point your attention to something on the screen because I'm going to come back to this when I begin discussing the SN Plus rating for this API service category. I want you to see on this timeline that General Motors introduced the Dexos 1 Gen 2 full synthetic product almost a full three years ahead of when API released the supplement category of SM Plus. SM Plus at the time, while it was meant to address uh, about three or four very important industry problems, one of the main things SM Plus addressed addressed was this thing called uh, low speed pre-ignition. And we'll get into what low speed pre-ignition is in a moment here. But I wanna, again, reference your attention to the 2018 supplemental release of SN Plus compared to when Dexos 1 Gen 2 was released. The last thing on this screen I'd like to draw your attention to is the ILSAC. Now, we talked about the American Petroleum Institute, and we know that that means API. The ILSAC rating kind of goes hand in hand. They both are two different committees, but ILSAC and API kind of work together. ILSAC was a bunch of manufacturers that basically got together and addressed of all of one of the most important categories of significance was fuel economy. The American Petroleum Institute really never addressed fuel economy, but ILSAC did. Now, the difference between the two. On the back, we already discussed that on the back of the container, you're going to see the API service donut. If it's ILSAC certified, another certification, again, for the consumer, for the technician, for the shop owner, looking to make sure if an oil's resource conserving, right, we're going to have an ILSAC starburst on the front of the container. Starburst on the back, the ILSAC uh, starburst, the API service donut on the back, and the Starburst uh, logo is on the front, generally on the container. And you could see that through the years, just like the API, we have service categories for GF one, two, three, four. As each new service category, both the ILSAC, right, International Lubricant Standardization Approval Committee, that's what it stands for. As each one of these came up through the ranks through the years, the newest one 
was always the one that was backwards compatible. So SM, when it was introduced in 2004, was always backwards compatible with the earlier service categories. Same thing for ILSAC. GF4, once we went to a GF4, GF5, when we got the GF5, which was the most recent specification up until May 1st of 2020, all of these, once we went to GF5 certification, the older ones, they were backwards compatible. So as soon as we went to a GF5, you could put this in your engine and all of these other service grades in previous recommendations were all, they could have been obsolete because the GF5 became uh, the, the, approve, the approval for that recommendation and all of these were backwards compatible at that point. So this oil met the spec for all the other oils that preceded it. When we're discussing base oils and base oils are important, you've got quite a number of companies out there that, that basically develop base oils and get good quality base oils and for automotive purposes when I group this into group one and group two, that really doesn't have any purpose for automotive right now at the time of this particular uh, webinar today. But I wanna draw your attention to group three. Group three, quite a number of years back, the oil companies began to look at group three, group three readily abundant, a little cheaper than the group four, which is true synthetics. The group three could go through a process of being hydrocracked, synthesized. Once the group three uh, oil is synthesized, hydrocracked, and goes through its distillation process and it's all finished, we can now put this in a category in this country, in North America. We can now group group three base oils as a full synthetic product in this country. We can't do that overseas, can't do it in the UK, can't do it over in Germany, not permitted over in Asia. But in America, North America specifically, we are allowed to market, build oils and sell them in the North American market that are group three oils as a full synthetic product. And the reason is the viscosity index. If the viscosity index, according to SAE approval, hits 120, it goes above 120, it can now be labeled as a synthetic product. That's a key point here that's for the future. When you're thinking about changing oils in the shop, or you're thinking about changing vendors or going to a different oil product that you're going to introduce into the shop. Viscosity index numbers are very important. And those numbers are arbitrary, which means that those numbers are defined in a lab and those values could change and they could change dramatically from let's say 80 all the way up to 400. You could have a mobile one product that has a viscosity index of onwards of 300 plus. It's an arbitrary number. And here's what's important about viscosity index. Earlier we said that as we raise the temperature of the oil. If you took olive oil on the stove in a frying pan and you measured that viscosity cold when you put it into the frying pan, it would behave a little bit different than if we brought it to 212 degrees. Besides that, when it gets to operating temperature on the stove, just like oil in an engine, it's going to thin out. Viscosity index, think about it like this. I want you to think about cold versus hot. As we begin to go from a cold viscosity, resisting flow, if I took oil out of the freezer and I decided to pour it out, it would be like the old commercial for ketchup. Anticipation is making me great. Here's the deal. If I took a cold oil and decided to pour it out, it would resist flow. If I heated that oil up, right, it goes up, it gets hotter, and it becomes thinner. 
Well, think about this being like a sliding pond. Like you put the kids at the top of the sliding pond and that rate of change is drastic, okay? Now, if I take the viscosity index and I put some improvers in it, I put some additives into that oil, into the base oil, I can now take that steep viscosity index change that's dramatic and I can now narrow it down so it looks a little goofy and it may become a, a little hard to distinguish but if that rate of change is less than the original uh, viscosity index that number actually goes up so as the viscosity index number goes up it's improved. It's a better oil if I have a higher viscosity index. So that's a little bit about what we need to address when we're discussing base oils and the viscosity index number that's assigned to those groupings. In your, on your slide at the bottom in a black box, I give you a note. Viscosity index basically measures the ability of the engine oil to resist changing, right, or going from a drastic difference from hot to cold, becoming thinner, right, at higher temperatures. If I can increase that viscosity index, there's less of a change in the oil's characteristics when it gets hotter. Now, when we're discussing the molecules between conventional and synthetic, I'd like to introduce Joe Smith for this afternoon session to just share with you uh, some of the things that he has to bring uh, to this webinar this afternoon, which is pretty, pretty uh, decent information with regards to how synthetic oil molecules would behave as compared to conventional oil molecules. Joe, if you would be so kind, please join us. Thank you, Peter. Good afternoon, everyone. I just wanted to touch base on something with regard to this uh, slide that we're currently taking a look at on the molecular structure of the conventional motor oil versus the synthetic motor oil. And uh, I'm reminded of a, an occasion that I had in my career about nine years ago where one of the major, major original equipment manufacturers had extended their interval for oil change to 10,000 miles. So at the training center, there was a lot of concern about having issues with sludged engines as a result of this extended uh, change interval of 10,000 miles. So uh, Mobile One was brought in and their engineers spoke to several of the trainers. And one of the things that really stuck out to me as significant was an analogy that they used of two, if you can imagine in your mind's eye, two tabletops and two pieces of wood that you needed to slide across the top of these tabletops. You can imagine there's some friction involved there. So their, their analogy was to compare on one table in between the tabletop and the wood, differing ball bearings and marbles, different size diameter. And then on the other side, in between the wood and the tabletop was identical sized, identical diameter ball bearings. And their question, they posed to us it was which one would produce less friction and be more easy to push the wood across the tabletop. Of course, we had guessed the identical size molecules as referenced in this graphic that we have on this slide. And they had mentioned that's one of the things that is most significant in several things that are significant about the synthetic oil was that the molecules are identically sized. Subsequently, when we need to have rotating and reciprocating parts in the engine, we have reduced friction. Subsequently, with the reduced friction, we have improved fuel economy, which I'm sure most all of you are familiar of the corporate average fuel economy standards that are placed on original equipment manufacturers. And they are, quite honestly, struggling to be able to achieve those for many of their products. People want big trucks, big sport utilities and it's difficult to be able to achieve those numbers with larger vehicles. So synthetic motor oil is one of the ways that they're able to make improvements in uh, reaching the corporate average fuel economy. I thought that was kind of a significant analogy that might be helpful. I just wanna kind of piggyback what Peter had said earlier with regard to the vehicle that had 520,000 miles, 20 of that, 20,000 of that being towing a vehicle and they had uh, changed the oil every 20,000 miles and to be able to see those photographs 
of the inspection uh, post uh, disassembly inspection is pretty impressive to me that they were able to achieve that kind of lack of wear, if you will, uh, under those severe conditions and that extended 20,000 mile chain. So if I could just offer one thing, I know that, and Peter, you had mentioned this earlier that you've had a lot of shop owners and technicians that have said they just feel like the zero weight is too thin and they're concerned about the protection value. The reality is that we are really, we're obligated if we exercise due diligence as professionals, we are obligated to protect that customer's warranty. And if there's an engine failure and we have the ability to provide the documentation necessary to be able to document that the correct engine oil was installed, then the customer is gonna have that protection that they deserve and that we owe them to make sure we're putting in the right oil. If nothing else, to use the old analogy, just push the I believe button, that if that's what it came with, that's what it needs to have. But uh, Peter, you're doing a great job in sharing why and to be able to kind of unveil some of the mystery that might be involved for some of our technicians. So thanks for all that you're doing, folks. Thanks again for joining us. We're glad you're here. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give it back to Peter, but thanks, Peter. Appreciate your time. Thank you so much, Joe. Yeah, thanks for sharing that insight. Okay. So moving on to, I made a mention earlier that we'd be getting to SM Plus. Now there was a specific reason and there were many, but one of the primary reasons why SN Plus was, the, was developed and it was in basically in development for approximately 10, 12 years. They were trying to come up with this category and they finally came up and released it in May of 2018. Primarily what it was uh, constructed for and engineered for was to reduce this occurrence of low speed pre-ignition. And those were problems that were plaguing specifically uh, turbocharged direct injected gasoline engines. Now, how would you know the difference between an SN uh, rated oil and an SN plus? Well, just turn the container back around and look in the lower uh, section of the uh, donut. There you'll see the SN plus logo. And that's been the way it's uh, been uh, for quite a number of years. You're gonna see me share something with you from an oil uh, report to actually show you what happens when we went from an SN plus uh, service category to a oil that was, uh, in other words, went from SN uh, category to an SN plus supplement category oil. I'm gonna show you that in a uh, oil report here shortly. So let's talk about what low speed preignition is and what that SN plus uh, grade was designed to be modified to and designed for to look at and prevent or at least reduce. The gasoline direct injected engines now have put the injector right primarily right in the combustion chamber. As you could see there, I have a picture of a, uh, of a Jaguar uh, cylinder head and you can see the injector there sharing space in the combustion chamber with our spark plug, which is centrally located. On the right-hand side, I have some animations showing that as the intake stroke occurs, the propagation of the flame front is nice and it goes across the piston. The burn is you know, relatively even and it's only ignited by the spark plug, which is the way it's designed. In the LSPI animation here, you could see that as the piston comes down on the, uh, on the intake stroke and it comes up on the compression stroke that those low speed pre-ignition events are pre-exceeding the, the actual spark plug igniting the air fuel mixture. And unfortunately what this sets up is an absolute recipe for disaster within the combustion chamber, which can now begin destroying top lands of pistons and absolutely wreaking havoc on the, uh, on the combustion chamber. And of course, destroying uh, the engine, having catastrophic engine failure. So if you were to graph this, and we've got some information here to show in cylinder pressure, and you'd have normal combustion. Again, nice flame front across the, you know, across the top of the, of the uh, piston, nice even burn, propagation of the flame front, sets up, goes across the piston, east, you know, easy, nice even burn. As compared to the low speed pre-ignition events, you see that 
abnormal uh, section of that piston at a specific point, we get this abnormality where we have multiple flame fronts, which is set up. And again, this is wreaking havoc on these engines. One of the main things the SN plus rated oil was designed to do was limit this, if you will, or you know, eliminate it never, but at least reduce the propensity of this occurrence of low speed pre-ignition. So there's been a direct correlation and there's been some industry uh, laboratory tests that have indicated when we look at additive packages, one of the main ingredients in the additive package for detergency purposes, and we're basically moving the piston up and down in the chamber. In the cylinder head, in the top of the combustion chamber on a direct injected turbocharged engines at very you know low load like taking off from a light or from a stop sign uh, the stop start technology vehicles we do have some oil that's protecting the piston rings and basically providing a nice film on the combustion chamber on the cylinder wall if you would the problem is in those high pressure conditions, those oil molecules here that you could see here are now being scrubbed away and being mixed with the fuel during certain portions of when those pressures are going up. We inject the fuel into the cylinder at the proper time and unfortunately it creates this condition. Now what's, there's a direct correlation here between calcium, one of the ingredients in the detergency uh, in the additive package, uh, calcium has to be, happens to be one of the ingredients in the additive package. What does calcium do? Well, it's a cleaning agent. So there's a correlation between the addition of, or if the additive package has a nice increased value, right, increased amount of calcium, it increases the propensity of low speed pre-ignition to occur. So you could see there where we have high calcium as compared to low calcium. So again, we understand this, the engineers know this, that's one of the main reasons why we have the new categories of uh, GF6 and SP, um, <clears throat> SP6 uh, coming out and ILSAC GF6 specifications. Those service categories are changing. Now, this oil lab report is only about a third of what you'd see if you sent an oil out for analysis. And this kind of hinges on the last slide showing the calcium levels that are in the oil when we sent it out for analysis. Let me explain what we're looking at here. This is from my 2010 Ford Flex. This oil was changed at 7,500 miles with 177,000 miles on the vehicle, on the, on the engine. I changed it in May 2015. From right to left on the screen, each one of these columns represents a different oil service that I sent it out for analysis. So each one of the columns is a different report that came back to me when they analyzed my oil. So you could see that I had three oils, three oil analysis in 2015, May, August, and December. Now, I had 7,500 miles on this oil sample, 7,500 miles approximately on this oil sample, 8,377 miles on the oil when I changed it here, and there's 2015. Just to round out an apples to apples comparison for you. I did not, and I deliberately stopped sending the oil out for analysis, and then you could see what happened in May 2018, three years later. I began sending it out. At this point, the car now has 298,000 miles on the unit, and the oil is 8,000 miles. There's 8,000 miles of service on that oil. I want to draw your attention to something on the slide, the wear metals in parts per millionth. Down at the bottom, I've encircled that with a red triangle. You could see that on 177,000 miles, the calcium right was 2566. On the right side, when we get the oils 
report back. They give us universal averages. It's important to make sure we understand the universal averages on that report is specifically for a 3.5 Duratec V6 Ford engine. So you could see we're at 2566 for the calcium at the time they did the oil analysis. 2366 that same year, 2015 in August. 2537 at the end of the year. And again, I changed it in May, right? And I sent this oil out for analysis. It was still 2323, 2300 parts per million on the calcium. Now, look at what happened right here. If this was the last time I sent it out, in the, if this was the first time I did the analysis in 2018 in May, it was still 2323. At the end of that same year, when I changed the oil again, you could see that the calcium dropped almost in half. And it pretty much just stayed that way. You could see I did it again. I sent out another oil analysis in March of last year. This vehicle now has 362,000 miles on it. Peter Orlando does not change the oil on that car until Ford Motor Company, through the Oil Life Monitor, tells me when to change it. And really nothing has changed other than this calcium dropping. Now, some things have changed throughout the years of ownership, and I attribute that to certain, certain other anomalies that were occurring at that time. I may have been experimenting with different oils and so forth, but for this oil change in every single one of these, these are the exact same oils throughout the years. So you could see there's been a drastic difference. By a show of hands in the chat, if you don't mind, how many of you believe that that difference in the calcium drop was due to the SN rating going to the SN plus rating oil? What do you think? Raise your hands if you agree with that scenario, that the SN plus was that drop in, that, um, the, the, in the calcium deposit or the calcium control. What do we think? Excellent. That's correct. There was a significant change in the amount of calcium that the oil companies were introducing into those products at the time to hopefully look at low speed pre-ignition and do something about it. SN plus was the answer at the time to those issues that were plaguing the engines that had the low speed pre-ignition problems. So here we are at GF6, and you guessed it, what does GF stand for? Gasoline fueled. Now, this wasn't uh, due out when I did the slide. Yes, it was due out in May 2020, but this became effective May 1st, 2020. So as the oil companies now adjust to this new licensing, and as these API and these GF6 categories begin to change over, you're now going to see the new GF6 come up on the back of the oil container, but this category for the first time ever for gasoline fuel vehicles is broken down into two different categories, GF6A and gf 6 B. You see, when they were doing these tests on these engines, they realized that if they needed an oil, uh, categorically speaking, to do what it needed to do on the new oil and be backwards compatible, that there was a different set of circumstances for the oils that were going to be in a different service category, the lower viscosity oils like 0W16. So early on, we realized that when they were deciding on these specifications, that they had to break them up into two distinct categories. So here's the thing for us changing oil in the marketplace moving forward. We have to be cognitive of the fact that the new GF6A spec is backwards compatible. The 6B, which addresses just the 0W16 viscosity grade oils, is not backwards compatible. That is only going to be specified for the oils that are for those engines. Do not 
put a GF six B grade oil in an older car. It is not manufactured for it, and it will not withstand the heat and the cold pumpability that those engines that are designed to run on the GFB uh, GF six B spec is designed to operate on. Very important. Now. The GF6B will now be, instead of a starburst on the front of the container, you're going to see the new shield. API came up with a new icon to allow the technicians, allow the consumers to look at that icon and know that that is specifically for that grade, this low viscosity grade, you know, grade of lower viscosity grade of oil. And this is approved for six B engines, or in this case, API, the, the service shield serves the purpose for the 6B rated lower viscosity grade oils. You could see Toyota went one step further here. This is a uh, ambient temperature uh, correlation. That's what the letter A stands for in the chart. And you can see that over the temperature range of this vehicle, right, that this car is expected to operate under, the 0W16 is going to be doing a good job for the cold pumpability, right? Get the valve train lubricated in the required period of time. It has a uh, zero W, right? That's the cold weather viscosity grade. And it has a 16 uh, grade for the hot temperature specification. So again, this oil was specifically designed to run on this, let's say, 2019 rev. There are other vehicles which are going to be using that have already um, uh, provided this as a factory fill. Toyota's not the, the only manufacturer out there. Honda joins them in this uh, venture as well. But to help or aid the technician when they open the hood, there's going to be a sticker that's gonna be found someplace in the edge compartment on the radiator support to help tell the story that the oil that's in that vehicle is in fact an SAE 0W16. We have to be very careful here. Joe alluded to this earlier with regards to recommending any oils that the manufacturer does not recommend as far as the grades of viscosity. We need to be putting the proper grade viscosity oil back in our customers' cars. And the argument comes up that perhaps, right, that the manufacturer says this, but the, the consumer doesn't want to put the full synthetic oil product in their car. That could be and have detrimental effects on us as professionals. We just simply don't want to go down that road. Put the proper viscosity grade oil in the engine that the manufacturer prescribes. The performance advantages are listed here. And again, one of the main differences between the older API service categories and the new SP specification. Again, the SP specification goes hand in hand with the GF6 ILSAC specification. One of the most important advantages is the fact that it was designed for uh, to minimize low speed pre-ignition as well as some other performance advantages here that we see on the screen. Fuel economy advantage, fuel economy retention, engine durability, wear protection for idle stop engines because we do have a lot of engines that are using right auto stop start systems, engine oil aeration reduction, and of course turbocharger deposit control. So when we're making up a base oil and we're putting in these additives and we have the final product, when we're changing oil, we are really replenishing at the start the additive package that goes into the final product, the final lubricant formula. To help things along, I've included a Lubrizol specification comparison here. Now, what Lubrizol does on their website is it shows oil specifications at our choosing on the left-hand side, and it shows a web, if you will, of specific categories that when they're developing and putting together the additive package to uh, abide by a specification from a manufacturer. Shown here, you have about seven that revolve around the web and it starts at 12 o'clock. And by the way, these are not the only things that go into uh, 
the design and engineering of the oil product when an OE gives them the specifications for their engines. This is just looking at soot thickening after treatment compatibility, whether it's diesel and it has a diesel particulate filter or it's gas and it has a gasoline particulate filter. Fuel economy, we look at that. You saw that a second ago with regards to the SP specification. We're looking at fuel economy. That's on the radar. Hence the reason why we have the lower viscosity grade oils in the first place. Oxidative thickening, piston deposit control, sludge control, wear characteristics. So this value on the web stretches from zero in the center with a blue dot, and it goes out to a, a point of 10 on the web, as you're going to see here, when we pull up, and as an example, I'm going to pull up an API specification. When I click the mouse, we're going to push in SN+. Plus. So I pull up API on the Lubrizol spec comparison. I click the box on their site for SN Plus, and it shows me the characteristics of what the SN Plus category would be utilized to look at. And you could see that there's been some performance characteristics to enhance the oils. Uh, ability uh, to reduce oxidative thickening, right, to control piston deposits. And again, these values as you go around the web look like it's a, a value of four on the oxidative thickening. We're sitting there between uh, six and eight, so around a seven for oxidative thickening. Now if we pulled up a Volkswagen specification. Again, I don't lose, you know, leave the site. I leave this up. I just scroll down to Volkswagen and I pull up a Volkswagen 502 specification. You could see that there is a major difference. And again, I could back that up, show the SN plus, then show the 502 specification. Now this is important as observers of this particular specification. This is not to demonstrate that the Volkswagen 502 spec is better than the SN Plus. We're not trying to show you the difference here. What I am trying to demonstrate is there's a major difference between, let's say, a Volkswagen or an OE specification and what they look at and approve for, introdu for introduction into their engines compared to an industry oil specification. It's two different things. Earlier I mentioned the first thing we should be looking at is the industry spec, yes. But if there's an OE specification, I should be looking at that first and the grade or the viscosity of oil second. Big difference between industry oil specifications and OE oil specifications. And I'm going to bring to your attention here a couple of things to demonstrate that in a moment. Both of these oils are available in a 5W30 grade. So again, this is just to demonstrate that if a consumer was to go in to a store when they needed to add oil to their their crankcase. They pulled out the stick and they saw that they needed a quart of oil. We did a great job the last time we changed their oil. We put the Volkswagen 502 spec, you know, great oil into their car. We put the proper oil filter that's going to protect that engine. By the way, the Volkswagen 502 is an extended life oil. That oil could go to 10,000 miles with no problem, as long as the proper grade OE spec is put back in the crankcase. If the consumer decides to put a non-OE 502, 5W30 grade oil in that vehicle, it could have catastrophic effects over the long term on that car, on that engine. So if you and I as professionals are changing oil on that car, the consumer, at the time they pick it up, it has to be brought to their attention. Please, Mr. Consumer, we are putting a 
Castrol 5W30 Edge product in your vehicle. If this vehicle needs oil in the future, we ask that you please put back the oil. If you have to top off your crankcase, that you please put back the proper grade of oil that beats this 502 specification because there is a vast difference between a 5W30 grade of oil that doesn't and the Volkswagen 502 5W30 grade oil that we put in your car. Here's a perfect example. I have two completely different oil now. Here's a Pennzoil product up at the top. We now discussed 5W20. We discussed the viscosity grade. We discussed the service categories on the on the donut, which we could find on the back of the oil containers. And we also discussed the old GF5. Now, if we have a GF6 oil, the GF6 oil will now supersede the GF5. That's not a problem. If you put a GF6 oil in that car under the ILSAC rating, it's going to serve to protect that oil under those conditions. Both of these oils uh, have an SAE J300 specification for determining their viscosity grades. Here we have a 5W20. The other one we didn't discuss yet is the ASA or the ACEA ratings. Now, on the slide, I put down that that's another certification group, another group that's overseas, and that stands for European Automobile Manufacturers Association. Kind of another category to certify classifications or oil sequences, as ACEA calls them overseas. Now, on the back of the oil containers, you're also going to see AC. EA ratings. The A stands for gasoline and the B stands for diesel. There are two other classifications of which we don't have the time unfortunately to go through. Commercial grade and of course for uh, the classifications for catalyst protection. Uh, for, for this purpose of our webinar today I'm just going to choose the A1 and the B1. You'll notice that this through the years, they've also gone through some updates, kind of like our GF6, our GF5, our GF4. As the service categories changed, we kept on coming up with newer numbers to indicate the most recent classification. Well, this was a dash 10 introduced in those oil sequences in 2010. So the suffix on the ACEA is now that you can look at that and kind of understand, well, that was superseded by a dash 12. The ACEA oil sequences are now going to 2019. So they've been updated right throughout the years, just like our API service categories, just like our LSAT categories have been updated. So we have a Pennzoil Ultra Platinum 5W20 at the top, and we now have a 0W40 at the bottom. So just like I described a second ago with the Volkswagen spec, what happens if I go to the store and I see two Pennzoil Ultra Platinum full synthetic oils on the shelf, and they look like that. There's this one, and there's this one. I have two. 0W40 grades of oil. Again, like we asked before, what's the difference? In the essence of time, here's the answer. When you turn around that container and look on the back, you'll notice that this contains an API SN service category. The one on the right is the Platinum Euro, which carries a Mercedes-Benz Volkswagen. And I could blow this up for you, just so that you could see. This meets or exceeds the requirements for not just SN plus, API SN, the older category, and all previous categories, it also meets the A3, B4. This is the most recent ACEA category. So these oils are vastly different. If a consumer decides to put this oil on the right in an engine that was certified for SRT racing for Chrysler. This oil will not protect this engine and vice versa. They are two different 0W40 grades of oil, and they are certified to do 
you know, very different things in these two different engines. So the process. Again, I'm not here to tell everyone how to change oil, but it has changed, to coin a phrase from one of my favorite lyrics, from one of my, fer my favorite bands. Um, it goes something like, uh, changes aren't permanent, but change is. When we're changing oil, and you see a technician walk over to a car, right down to setting it up on the lift, and he changes, pulls out the, you know, pulls out the uh, drain plug and the oil begins to drain. I mean, who sits there and looks at how much oil drains out of the crankcase? Would it surprise you that if we're now looking at extended oils and the consumer is going 10,000, 7,500 miles on the oil change, if we didn't pull the stick on that car prior to changing the oil, who's going to sit there with the oil container and count out one quart, two quarts, three quarts. We just don't do that when we're changing oil. So it's important that before we change the oil, we pull the stick and we note it. We note down if there's, uh, you know, if it's low on the stick. The type of filter we're putting in the car, whether or not there's a torque spec. And most manufacturers provide a torque spec on the oil drain plugs. If you snap one, if you ever had the opportunity to snap one, now we know why the torque spec exists in the first place. Second, the oil life monitor reset procedure. Drain plug gasket, if it's required or not. Professional shops responsibility when we change oil is to not just drop the oil, replace the filter. It's a complete service. I used to call it a comprehensive service that we're doing on your car. The comprehensive service just happens to include changing the oil, changing your filter. But oh, by the way, these are the other things we're doing on your vehicle while it's here today for service. One of the most important things is educating the consumer on the oil products that we're selecting for reintroduce, reintroduction into their vehicles so we can protect the warranty. Oil filter choices. The reason why, there'd be no reason in my mind why I would put an extended life oil in the vehicle and not use a proper quality filter that has to go the distance. We'll get to oil filters here in a second. But why I would choose an oil filter that's not manufactured to go to distance, right? Same as the oil that I'm putting in there. If I'm putting an oil in the customer's car that has to go to 7,500 or 10,000 miles, I have to make sure I'm putting a, a compatible oil filter in there that's going to go the distance. Very important. Protection of the warranty. So we mentioned, if it has a dipstick, pull it. Note any repeat offenders. If you're bringing me this, in this particular case, this Volvo over and over and over again for the last 35, 45, 55,000 miles, every time I go to change your oil on your car, I'm noting that you're a quart and a half, two quarts low on the stick. That needs to be documented. And it needs to be documented early in the life cycle of the vehicle. Again, what happens if it doesn't have a dipstick? Some certain cars don't have a dipstick. On the right, we're checking it electronically on this BMW M5. The customer on the left that had the Volvo knew she was low on oil. She actually brought it in for service and said, oh, I use, you know, X oil in my car, and there are five quarts in the back. Would you be so kind when you're changing the oil to use that that oil in the car. It's not a problem. It's not a problem. We're putting back long as it meets or exceeds the recommendation for Volvo. The consumer on the right, when we checked it electronically that day, had no idea that that uh, indicator said that it needed a quart of oil. It's at the minimum level. Please add a quart of oil. So yes, the oil change process has changed completely. Right down to the, uh, the, the filters that we're using on our vehicles. Allow me to stop sharing the screen here and jump over to my other area here. Oils come in a variety of categories. So do filters. No oil is really the same, and the filters are not the same. When people say, well, all oil filters are created equal. No, they're not. You've got differences in the actual filter media from cellulose to synthetic, cellulose, synthetic, uh, the, the way that the oil filter is actually constructed, the end caps, the gasket, the uh, 
The drain back valves could be made from, you know, standard rubber versus on the better filters, right? They're silicone, nitrile. So all oil filters are not created equal. The other thing on oil filters is the importance of the filtration media. And a lot of manufacturers give us the micron filtration. Let me give you an idea as to what I'm talking about when I'm discussing micron filtration. If you were to tell me that this tennis ball was, I'm just going to use numbers, was 50 microns. Okay, if I'm playing tennis, no problem. This filter media, the tennis racket in this case, is going to do a good job of blocking and trapping this size tennis ball piece of dirt, right? So let's talk about absolute rating in microns. What would happen if we had dirt sized particles that are going through the filter? Micron's not good enough. How much it's filtering out? What's the efficiency of the filter? And if I kept on pouring the dirt into this filter, yeah, it could actually filter out certain size, meet the, the media could filter out certain size pieces of dirt. But over time, what happens if I kept on doing this and all of a sudden the filter's efficiency starts to drop? So micron filtration without an efficiency number is completely useless. Very, very important that we're looking at not just the micron and what it could filter out, but give me that with the efficiency rating of the filter. Very important. Good filters generally provide the filtration efficiency right on the box. And if we're looking for it because the box has been thrown away, very simple. Just go on any of the oil filter company's websites and you'll be able to provide, you'll be able to find the product data sheet for that particular oil filter. Make sure sure you're looking this up by the part number for the filter that's selected for that customer's car. When we're discussing filters, and I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, you can go to a GM bulletin there. I gave you the gmtechlink.com. And when that box, when that website loads in the search box, type in oil filters. These two oil filters, a 48, and the 64 are vastly different because of the internal bypass valve ratings of the two filters. Unfortunately, in the field, and General Motors was aware of this, on their Gen 5 engines, because of the oil pump on those engines, use a variable displacement oil pump. They basically hold off oil pressure until the main gallery, main gallery pressure uh, goes up above a certain value. In order to hold that there and maintain that pressure, the the 64 filter has a 22 PSI uh, internal bypass valve. The 48 has a 15 PSI opening for the bypass valve. Both of these filters look and, you know, by sight, the can size, everything looks identical to these filters. But if you put the 15 PSI, the 48 filter, on an engine, a Gen 5 GM engine that's manufactured for the 22 PSI, the 64 filter, you could have some serious consequences because the 48 filter is going to open up the bypass valve prematurely and you're going to have non-filtered oil circulating throughout the engine. So I tell technicians all the time, especially when we're discussing oil filters, don't ever think for a second. Years ago, we used to be able to get away with this. Look at, you know, the can size, you know, match up the gasket size and spin it on, lock it up, and we're good to go. We can no longer do that. We can't afford to make these costly mistakes in the field. Look up the oil filter for the application. For those of you that have um, not really watched or have seen the operation of a bypass valve in the filter with the uh, help of um, Moto Visuals here. You can see I'm going to play this short segmented animation and it will show the bypass valve, the oil coming in that's dirty and the clean oil that's returning. As the filter media begins to uh, plug up, 
it's better to have the bypass valve open and allow some filtration of oil and allow some circulation of oil back up into the engine and have some semblance of lubricating uh, the, the upper valve train and so forth rather than block it off completely. So that little animation shows you the spring operated bypass valve and those bypass valve again have different ratings based on the filter. It's very important that the filter we're choosing has the proper bypass valve opening rating pressure. If you want to look up that information, we should be able to see that on the manufacturers of all of the oil filters. When we're resetting the oil maintenance minder, please do not confuse an oil maintenance minder with an oil life monitor. They are two entirely different things. Uh, just to use simple terms, an oil maintenance binder generally just looks at an odometer count. You get to 5,000 miles, uh, 6,000 miles, 7,500 miles, and it just simply tells us change the oil. There's no computer algorithms. It's not looking at warm-up times. It's not looking at idle times. It's not looking at acceleration rates. It's not looking at how long it took for the engine to get from you know cold up to operating temperature. doesn't do anything like that. So it's very important that consumers, when we change their oil, they're prepared and they completely understand what this oil life monitor is and what we did when we reset it at the time of service. It is extremely important that they're prepared. There's a major difference when it comes to professional shops having consumers that are surprised by problems versus being prepared by problems. When we changed the oil and serviced that Volvo in the shop, we brought the consumer out, we showed them that this has been reset and this is now reset and it basically indicates to you now driving around that this will tell you that this car is due for service in the next 12 months or 10,000 miles, whatever comes first. As a matter of fact, the reason why we obtained this customer was because previous to servicing it, she just could not get someone to reset the maintenance binder on this vehicle. And it is a little involved on the Volvo. I will tell you that there is certain buttons that has to be pressed at specific sequences in time and then turn the key on, cycle the key, it's involved. So if you don't have the reset procedure, it's going to add some time to the job. And as a professional shop, I think it's up to us to be prepared for that as well. So the Lexus here, the simplest way uh, to reset this is just, this is just an example of a reset procedure. It's very simple. You press the trip button in, you hold it in, you turn the key on. The dashboard's going to light up and the odometer reading will clock down with dashes. It'll go to zero. The mileage will come up and done. It's reset. It's that simple. Some cars are not as simple as this. Again, be aware of the reset procedure and make sure the consumer knows it's been reset and the significance of the reset procedure. So today to summarize, we talked about modern oils. We talked about the properties of engine oils and the SAE grading that goes along with them. The differences between synthetic and conventional oil molecules. We talked about low speed pre-ignition, what causes it and how to prevent it. We talked about the new GF6 and um, API SP categories. We also discussed engine oil specifications. And of course, we discussed a little bit about today's oil and filter changes, the importance of protecting the warranty, and of course, oil filtration technologies. On behalf of myself, Advanced Auto Parts, Carquest Technical Institute, and our panel of moderators today, I know your time is precious, and I thank you for spending it today with me. I'd like to open it up for questions and answers at this point. I'm going to stop my share. There we go. Thank you, everyone. Hey, Pete, thanks for that great presentation. We do have a question in Q&A uh, that I want to share with the whole group. It was answered privately. Uh, and it's about oil viscosity. Dylan asked if you take an example of oil with viscosity ratings of 530 and then suggest that the oil is thicker when hot, uh, are the viscosity numbers different for cold and hot? Uh, would you guys like to address that as a panel? Um, sure. Um, 
so if I understand the question correctly, um, is it going to behave uh, different when cold as compared to hot? Yes. Okay, so yes, the viscosity value will change. That's the reason why we classified it as a multi-grade oil. The viscosity classification of let's say a 5W, five winter grade oil, it will flow easier when cold as compared to when it gets hot. When it gets hot, there's some molecules that go to work on the oil to allow it to become a 30 grade viscosity oil when it reaches that 212 degrees uh, Fahrenheit in the lab. So yes, there is a definite difference between the 5W cold weather viscosity. It operates and flows easier when it's cold, when it's a five grade rating versus 30. Absolutely. You guys want to weigh in on that? Any difference? Joe? John? It's a great explanation, actually, Peter. Thank you. One of the things uh, to think about when it comes to engine oil is, let's say you had a 10-weight oil. And when the if you can imagine the oil always being at a 10-weight all the time, it would protect the engine correctly. But of course, you know, with our oils, they do thin out as you get hotter. They do get thicker as they get colder. And meanwhile, that 10 weight would be the correct viscosity all the time. Now, the oil needs to try to mimic that. And essentially, that's what we're talking about here. Excellent. Okay. Randy, we do back have, to you. We do have one question that popped up from Gil in chat. And he says, or he asks, excuse me, are manufacturer specifications calling for more calcium as compared to the industry specifications, specifically SN plus? And maybe maybe that uh, topic of low speed pre ignition needs to be needs to be addressed a little deeper as far as uh, the cause of low speed pre ignition. I'd like to address that if you would. Please. Uh, low speed pre-ignition is thought to be caused as, not as pre-ignition as we think of it, uh, but pre-ignition actually auto-ignition. And so it's not, uh, it's not ping or detonation as we think of detonation. It's actually auto-ignition and it's auto-ignition of small particles of oil as it comes up through the rings on the, uh, on the intake stroke. And the results are almost three times the pressure that's developed in a normal detonation. Um, what I have read so far is that calcium is the one additive that, uh, that helps prevent that. And so whether or not it's the manufacturer specification calling for more calcium is the industry standard. If you're talking about the oil industry, uh, we would weigh in on the uh, manufacturer standard, I believe. Comments, yeah, guys? And it's not going up. It's actually re being reduced, reduces the propensity yeah. of that. Not going, yeah, not oh, going the other way. Yeah, it's okay. We're good. We're good. Um, hopefully that's understood. That's one way that they are reducing the occurrences of low speed pre-ignition was to address, right, the calcium deposits. If they were higher, then yes, we have the, a more likely uh, chance of the LSPI occurring. Now, there's other things that are going on there. Obviously, these engines are, you know, very low um, low displacement engines. They're two liters, 2.5, two two liter engines. There's a lot of work that's being done, especially during stop start, low load conditions. But to answer your question, are the manufacturer's specifications calling for uh, more calcium as compared to the industry specifications? I want to make sure that that was um, asked from a from the perspective, uh, are you asking us if the manufacturers are increasing the calcium? No, they're decreasing the calcium is what they're doing. They're using other methodologies, other additives to, uh, to, to supplement the calcium decrease, which again, by doing that, it's reducing the propensity of the LSPI occurrences. So I hope we answered your question. If we need to go deeper into that topic, Gil, just email Randy and we'll, we'll, we'll provide you with that in, a, in, a, uh, in an email answer. Thanks, everybody. You guys be safe out there.